Now we've seen some of the basic information we've been working with. We're now going to get down how do you start with a real diagnostics. Forget the theory. Yep, we're going to talk about theory, but we're going to show you an example here of how to do some testing where your theory doesn't quite make things work for you. So you're going to have to do a little bit more. But you're going to start with your vehicle specific information to get your signal test points. And then the diagram is going to be used to pinpoint testing if something is wrong. Then we're going to get into the very important part. How do you analyze the scope pattern? The most important part about this marriage on the internet is you have all this multitude of diagnostics to go look at, utilizing scopes, telling you what the pattern is supposed to look like, fuel injectors for secondary ignition, for all these other things we're talking about. It's going to help you diagnose it. Even communications, which is the most advanced communications diagnostic I've ever seen. That's what you're going to be doing with the scope. You're going to have to find out what you can see that is not in scan data. Now let's go look at our starting diagram and see what we need to know. Pretty simple. We have a coil pack on the left. It's nothing but a coil. We've got a PCM that makes all the decisions in the middle. It's powered up by an, AC, an ASD relay. We've got a cam and crank signal on the right. It gets 8 volt power and sensor return signal. It has two signals coming into the PCM pin 33 and 32. We're going to go to these two spots, but we're not going to get there the way most people do. We didn't try to dig around and get to the crank and cam sensor. They're not easy to get to in this particular vehicle. Neither is the PCM. So we went to the wiring harness going to the PCM. We found the tan and yellow wire, the gray and black wire, and we used one of our many adapters we'll be showing you to tie in there. So now that we have that, let's see what else we get out of the schematic. If our signals are badly wrong, right here we see what wires have the signal return and what has the 8 volt power. If we have no signal or the signal is totally bad and we have power and ground to the sensor, odds are the sensor is bad. But remember, sometimes there's problems with the target that the sensor is picking up. Flex plates on some Chrysler's in the rear of the engines develop cracks, which generates extra pulses. The diagnostics we're going to show you will show you how to identify that. Let's talk about what we're looking for. We have an example of what our signal is supposed to look like. At the top is the cam. It's got a wide part or high at the 180 degree point. And then between 360 and 540, it's got a smaller high portion. We look at the bottom. The first group of four has a wide pulse at the first pulse. The second group, four skinny pulses. The third group, group is two wide, well, a wide pulse, three skinnies. And the last pulse is, three, is four skinnies again. This is done so the vehicle can quickly identify which coil pack to fire. One half revolution. It knows which coil pack to fire. Now we have a lot of people tell us this vehicle won't start if you lose the cam signal. Not true. It will have long cranking times, but it will still start. And part of the reason is we have information stored in the bottom telling us when number one cylinder is coming from top dead center. And we're going to show you how to figure that out in a little while. We have an expectation. But let's break this down further. We know the signal looks like, and it tells us here we're going to have two volts per division, and we have two and a half divisions, which tells us the signal, the voltage scale we're going to set has to cover 5 volts, which means it's going to be bigger than 5. And the time base, the sweep, how fast do we sweep? To get this whole pattern, we want to see 720 degrees of engine rotation. Now I know a lot of scope people say, hey, focus in, trigger tight on one pulse. Does it have rounded corners? Is it? We've never fixed cars with that. And we've seen people that do that that couldn't fix a car. That when we came in, slowed the trace down and got a full pulse train like this, we could easily determine we had extra or missing pulses. Remember I was telling you about the cracks in those flex plates? They're going to cause extra pulses. If you slow it down, you can see those extra pulses. We've had hall effects that are erratic and they don't 
give us reliable pulses every time. When we have a full pulse strain, we can see the ones that are missing. This is what scope testing is all about. Finding those problems that are going to kick your butt because this information isn't available anywhere else. So sweep speed, if we're going to get a full pulse strain, has got to cover two engine revolutions. This engine idles at 750 revolutions per minute. Let's break that down. If we divide 60 seconds by 750, we'll find how many revolutions we make in a second. In this particular case, it takes us 0 0.08 seconds to make a revolution. We want two engine revolutions, so multiply it by two. That gives us our 720 degrees of engine rotation. If we select a scope pattern like that, we'll get the right sweep rate. Now, a lot of scopes have auto test setup options. And there are special settings for testing specific components. And it's wise to start there if possible. But don't always count on them showing you everything you want to see. We're going to start with whatever comes up when the scope is turned on. And we're going to cover all possibilities in our example. Now, at first try, there are times when you connect your scope to the circuit. You figure out what you want to see for a waveform, and the waveform doesn't look anything like what you expected. Start with what you have on the screen, then make adjustments to, to get the correct settings. We'll need to adjust the voltage scale and the sweep rate. And after we get the pattern set, we'll work on the trigger and show you some difficulties sometimes triggering on certain signals. But we want to stabilize this pattern to look for extra or missing pulses. Look at our signal here. The blue trace is a little erratic, but the red trace is all over the place. It can't decide what voltage it's looking at. It's jumping around. Looks like it's totally confused. If we were to make an instant decision based on this, if we don't know any more, we would say that the red cam signal is bad and the blue crank is fine but it may have missing pulses. Looking at it again, it's starting to run. We can't make any sense out of the red trace. It's nothing like the shape we're expecting. We're going to start off by looking at our system. We're pointing out two things here. It's an auto voltage. And we've got a red and a blue scale. We're going to talk about auto voltage later and tell you why this is causing a problem. But to start with, we're in a one millisecond per division. We said we needed about 200 milliseconds full screen. We have 10. Let's see what happens when we put this on the right sweep rate. We go to 20 milliseconds per division, which gives us 200 full screen. And boom. Look what happened. All we did was set up the right sweep rate. And we got the picture we needed. Now don't get confused. In the drawing we had the cam on top and crank on bottom. Here it's reversed. But do we have everything we're looking for? In the crank we have four groups of patterns in 720 degrees. Remember this is slightly longer than 160. So in the middle we have 720. We got two with long first pulses and two with four regular size pulses. We've got a long and a short pulse at the bottom of the cam. Everything we're looking for is here. So we automatically have done a few things. Let's see exactly what it is we've done. All we did to get a pattern to stabilize. We have not come off auto voltage scale yet. We've gone to 200 milliseconds total screen. One change and one change only. The voltage is an auto. It's set for a 5 volt level on the 10 volt scale. There's 5 volts. 5 volts over here. Both of them are on 10 volt scales. Now here's the point you need to understand. This scope is going to try to automatically set the level for whatever is on the screen. When we had this set to 1 millisecond per division, 20 times faster, we could not get the full pattern for the cam on the bottom. So when the cam was low, it's trying to auto zero for a low voltage. When it's 5 voltage, it's trying to auto zero up to 5 volt. It could get enough information 
to give us a sync in the right voltage on the blue scale because there's enough pulses there in one millisecond. But it looked like there are pulses coming and going, we're losing. That's the point we're trying to make. Rather than try to focus on one narrow, small thing, get on a big enough scale, you can see everything. Now let's see what this looks like when we start triggering. Because we have our triggering set at a reasonable point on the cam. We're going to run this and see how well it does. Notice this is uneven spacing. Triggering is going to either trigger on the increasing edge or falling edge of a signal. Which signal it picks is a little bit random. Let's see how that looks when you go into a little bit more difficult of a trigger. We're going to be an auto trigger. This is our triggering point right here. Let's let this pattern run and see what we get. It looks reasonably good, but if you notice, it's jumping around a bit. The reason it's jumping around a bit isn't because we have the wrong trigger point. There is no magic trigger point. It is set for increasing slope. Auto trigger is working fine. It's working about halfway up the pulse. It's going on the rising edge. The problem is there's two different pulses down here. Which one is it going to choose? Is it going to choose the long one or the short one? And it alternates picking different ones and makes the pattern look like it's jumping around. Unevenly spaced signals will do this to you. Don't let it concern you. Now, in fact, we can see there are no missing or extra pulses. But if we wanted to, we can make this even better. If you go through this slowly, you will see some noise in here that could cause a problem. But it's not going beyond halfway. So there's no major problems to be found. In. Just to review, we looked at our drawing at the bottom here and laid over the top of this. We can see all parts of the pattern. Uh, if we wanted to stabilize this, we could trigger on the number one injector. What we're going to do is we're going to add number one injector to the third channel and we're going to trigger off the number one injector. The number one injector always fires for number one cylinder. It's equally spaced. If you see here, this tells us we're going to fire the number one injector right at the falling edge of that extra wide pulse in the crank. It does it on the left, it does it on the right, in between are the other three cylinders. So now you're seeing a new dimension. But since this is evenly spaced, guess what's going to happen? If it's evenly spaced intervals, we're going to have a nice steady pattern. This is our trigger point. We're triggering off channel C. We have made those changes. So what you're going to see here is we're going to change our triggering and our channels. We're going to go through later and show you all the different things you can change. But this is what we're triggering right now, right where that arrow is pointing on the downward slope of the black trace. Look at the pattern. It's moving. We're running. The engine is running. If you have any noise, and there is some noise, you can see it occasionally in here, but not making any significant difference. The pattern is locked in and steady. Now you can see how we could find a problem with cracks in the flex plate and other things. Anytime we change engine speed you will see this accordion effect where it's speeding up and slowing down. So now you have seen it steady. We got into advanced trigger. We triggered off something that's going to give us a nice steady pattern. We've got three things up here at one time. We've got injector, crank, and cam. Let's examine this relationship between crank and cam a little better and see how it knows where number one cylinder is located because that's the key. What happens here, the long crank signal is high at the same time the cam signal remains low for the entire crank sequence. That identifies the PCM number one is on compression stroke and we fire the injector. Notice in the middle we have another long crank pulse but in this particular case the first part of the long crank pulse has a high cam signal. It's up at the 5 volt level. Where that arrow is pointing, when that pulse goes high and cam is high, it knows number one is on the exhaust stroke. Now we're going to fire the same coil pack because we fire wasted spark. Injector for the center one will fire at this point in time. We could put all four injectors up here and they would all be tied to those four groups you're looking on the screen. We're looking only at number one injector now, just so you understand that. This is not all the injector. So what we have now is the absolute relationship. And you can understand why a problem or a noise in here will mess this pattern up. Now we got here the easy way. We did everything for you. Let's look at things we could do wrong and goof things up. Suppose we were off scale with gain too low. What we've done here, 
when you completely fill up the screen and you see that little red dot we're pointing to in the corner it says the signals going off screen the voltage scale is set too low the top of the signal may look like the correct voltage scale was selected but in fact it just squared off the trace is going off the top of the screen and if you have anything going up there you won't be able to see it you just have to be aware of this in order to avoid it how do we not do this with our choice we went and found some information that told us what kind of voltage scale to expect we went to auto voltage scale and as long as you got the sweep rate set right the auto voltage scale will work fine but it won't work if the sweep rate is wrong now here's where we have a sweep rate it's really slow it's down to all crunched together we can't read it there's a lot of pulses here and we can't make it heads or tails it's too slow so yes we want to see the whole pulse train but we need to see enough pulse train to see it here's a case where the voltage gain is set too high it's set to 50 volts and we've got a little transition here but it's so small we can't see it you need to know what to expect the next section we're going to go through and we're going to talk about all the settings you need to make and how you need to make them and do some advanced testing so this gives you a good overview of how you can get patterns on the screen you can stabilize difficult stabilized patterns by finding something that's more stable than the signal you're looking at but remember whatever you put on the screen should have a relationship we related injectors to crankshaft and cam they are all related together you can't put map and crankshaft together they have no relationship to each other now if you're looking at waveforms in the manifold you could synchronize them with number one injector and see where the waveforms are taking place you can look at pulses in the exhaust and synchronize them to the waveform of number one injector we can do a lot of different testing but understand whatever you do has to have a relationship now let's go on to the next section